I am so very pleased to welcome you tonight to the Greater Washington Community Foundation's 2023 Celebration of Philanthropy. You know, this is a special celebration as we commemorate the Foundation's anniversary and 50 years of lasting impact on our region. Yes, that deserves a lot of claps. I'm sure you guys can read and you know that our theme for the evening is history, hope, and healing. For 50 years, the Community Foundation has made history as a community leader, convener, and advocate. As a philanthropic partner to individuals, families, and businesses at the forefront of this region's philanthropic legacy, and as the region's largest local funder of nonprofits addressing critical needs. Um, I know many of you have social media tonight, so by the way, if you do, I think it's always important to share and let your networks know what's going on, where you are, why you're helping raise money and the causes that you're supporting. So I always like to take a picture with the audience, if you don't mind. You guys mind? Okay. All right, we're gonna see if I can get everybody in here. You guys ready? Okay, I'm gonna tweet that out in just a minute, so make sure you guys do the same throughout the night to let your networks know what's going on. The Community Foundation's work has inspired hope in our community, even in its darkest days, through economic recessions, government shutdowns, the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon, the COVID-19 pandemic, and so much more. The Community Foundation played a critical role as a community quarterback during our community's most challenging times. Now guided by a commitment to pursue economic justice in our region, the Community Foundation seeks to foster healing as it confronts the greatest challenges facing our communities. What excites me tonight is to be here to learn even more about the Community Foundation's exciting new strategic vision and the next phase of its critical community work, its critical impact on the work in our community. You're gonna hear more about that in just a few minutes from our CEO, Tony Owellens. And by the way, if this is your first time attending tonight's celebration, you are in for a real treat tonight. No celebration would be complete without delicious food. Do we agree on that? An open bar. Yeah. I figured I would get more of you to cheer on that. <laughs> and of course, incredible performances, which you've already seen tonight, from local nonprofits, arts groups that showcase what makes our region truly remarkable. Tonight, we will also honor Terry Lee Freeman, who left her own lasting impact. She left her own lasting impact on this community as CEO of the Community Foundation for nearly 20 years. Terry's gonna join me on stage in just a minute for a fireside chat to talk about her experiences in leading our community through crisis, instigating conversations about race, racism, and her current work to help us better understand and appreciate our country's history. Following tonight's program, you are invited to stay and join us in Heritage Hall on the main level for exciting and delicious arrays of food, plus more performances throughout the evening. Additionally, guess what? You guys have exclusive access to the museum's exhibits until 10 p.m. tonight. After that, I want you all to go home and turn on News 4 at 11. I'm just saying. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to introduce the Community Foundation's board chair, Richard Bynum. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Richard Bynum, and I am proud to welcome you on behalf of the Community Foundation's Board of Trustees. I've served as a trustee for the past three years, and one of my favorite things about the foundation is the connection that the foundation allows me to understand what's going on in our region, be it the district, Virginia, Prince George's County, or Montgomery County. This is a historic evening for the Community Foundation as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. We are thrilled to come together this evening to celebrate what makes our community foundation and our region truly remarkable. The people and the partners who've done so much to support and strengthen our community through time. As a community foundation donor or partner, you're part of the community of change makers which has invested nearly $1.7 billion in this region. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. Truly, truly remarkable. 
We are honored to be a trusted advisor and a steward to the generous individuals, families, and businesses from across the region who rely on the Community Foundation to effectively manage their charitable resources and guide this region's philanthropic response to community needs. Last year, the Community Foundation and our donors granted out more than $92 million to thousands of not-for-profit not organizations serving the greater Washington community and beyond. And this is a true testament to the generosity and the commitment of our community givers, and we think it's worth celebrating. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Community Foundation's president and CEO, Tanya Wellens. Tanya was named the CEO at the, just at the start of the pandemic a little more than three years ago, and she certainly hit the ground running by leading the region's largest coordinated philanthropic response and recovery effort for which she was recognized as the not-for-profit leader of the year by the Washington Business Journal. Based on what we've learned through that response, Tanya has also led the board and staff to develop an ambitious 10-year plan to pursue economic justice. Please join me in welcoming Tonya to the stage. Wow. Thank you, Richard, for those lovely remarks and for the lovely introduction and for your service to our community foundation. History, hope, healing. This is the theme of our 50th anniversary celebration. A look back at our past and all of the incredible people who have come to know, love, commit to and invest deeply in this community. Hope represents our present, our persistent commitment to build community, to respond to current conditions, to express our love for humanity by giving and engaging and working for and with people in community right now. And healing for us represents a future of repair, of respite, of restoration, it represents our commitment to fulfilling the tenets of a democracy not even intended for many who continue to fight for it. It speaks to our obligation to envision new futures where people who have been, where people have been made whole, where dignity is restored, and where opportunity is not just within reach, but is available to every corner, every zip code, to every race, creed, and color. Welcome to our 50th anniversary celebration. <laughs> and welcome to the museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. You all look really good out there. <laughs> there are many elected officials here with us uh, this evening who've come across from, from across DC, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. I wanna invite you to just stand very quickly to be acknowledged. We want to thank you for your support over the years of you, an elected official who's in the room. Please, please, please stand. Thank you. If you are a former trustee, a former staff, a fund holder, a nonprofit leader, and a partner, that should include everybody in here, just wave your hand. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, we also received proclamations from Mayor Bowser, um, a joint proclamation from the M Montgomery County County Executive and Council, a joint proclamation from Prince George's County uh, Council, and special notes of congratulations from the Governor of Virginia, from senators from Maryland and Virginia, plus a joint congressional resolution, from co including Congresswoman uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. <laughs> very, very awesome. Our dear friend, Representative Jamie Raskin, sent a video that we got to view earlier. Um, you know, he is recovering from completing chemotherapy, and he, we wish him really, really good health and recovery. I want to say a special thank you to our community champions and corporate event sponsors for their support of the Community Foundation. It is because of their generosity that we've raised over $1 million to support our foundation. 
and our vision for a more racially equitable, just, and thriving Greater Washington where everyone prospers. I want to specifically highlight our 50th anniversary circle, Brown Advisory, Earth Landing, and the Cliff and Debbie White Family Foundation, our benefactors, the Bainham Family Foundation, Bethesda Magazine, Capital One, Care First, Chevy Chase Trust, Leah Dean, Chirito and Bill Cravant, the Leader Family Foundation, the Meyer Foundation, MGM, National Capital Bank, Roger Sant, and Representative Dol Doris Matsui, SEI, Smart Family Foundation, Sterling Spearn, and Diana Aviv. Let's give them all a round of applause. So tonight we are excited to celebrate the spirit of philanthropy by acknowledging a person who continues to live out their commitment to justice and freedom and equi an equitable future for all of us. A person whose work honors history, embraces hope, and builds the future we've all dreamed of. In just a little bit, we'll introduce you to our Spirit of Philanthropy Award honoree, Terry Lee Freeman. Terry is the first black woman and the longest serving CEO of the Greater Washington Community Foundation. Terry's vision, visionary leadership and trailblazing work certainly impacted all of us and has inspired us all. I also want to highlight the many ways that I see the spirit of philanthropy at work every day in our community through the actions of our trustees, our volunteers and donors, partners who've collectively helped us unleash the power of 1.7 billion in investments since 1973. The Community Foundation was founded against the backdrop of the Civil Rights Movement as the District Home Rule Act was signed into law. These events inspired a group of prominent business and civic leaders to establish a public charity, a small public charity, with broad interest to promote permanent, a permanent source of philanthropic capital for the Washington metropolitan region. Many of our original founders, founding trustees, were part of the civil rights movement, both locally and nationally, including the co-founder of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, uh, a member of the first elected DC Council, and a Justice Department lawyer who worked on civil, the Civil Rights Act. With initial seed funding from the Meyer Foundation and the Morris and Gwendolyn Capritz Foundation, amongst others, other funders, our founders' vision for the Community Foundation continues to be carried out by the volunteers, the donors, and the partners who have come to help this organization grow to be the largest local funder in the entire region, dispersing over $80 million on average per year. We, hope, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the late Bob Lenos, who became chair. <laughs> Bob Lenos became chair of the Community Foundation's board in 1992, and he invited influential leaders like Catherine Graham, Joan Maxwell, Larry Huff, Stuart Bainham, Vicki Sant, Michelle Hagens, Diane Bernstein, Charita Cravant, and a list of others to join him in revitalizing the organization. His leadership ushered in an unprecedented period of growth and achievement for the Community Foundation Lenos also hired Bill Hart, an early CEO who is here with us tonight. <laughs> Bob Lenos also hired Terry Freeman. <laughs> over the last five decades of our community, over the last five decades, our community of givers has grown to include over 770 funds and nearly a half billion in assets under management. We've supported various interests of our donors from memorial funds that honor the lives of loved ones to scholarships supporting students from across the region. We've been trusted to steward the legacy of many donors who choose us in their plans beyond their lifetime. And we are proud to have led or housed dozens of collaboratives that engage partners across multiple sectors and jurisdictions. Together with our donors and partners across the region, we've offered grants 
that have supported more than 23,000 nonprofits to help start or expand programs that improve the quality of life of our neighbors in the region. From our earliest grants for economic development projects in DC to our work today to close the racial wealth gap in our region. With community foundation support, more students are able to pursue their academic goals. More workers have been able to launch family sustaining careers. More families can access enrichment programs and early child care. More individuals, youth, and families have stable housing. And more families are moving from crisis to stability. Our hope is to move them from stability to mobility, and ultimately that they'll have a real shot, shot at thriving. Over the years, the Community Foundation has supported, launched, and incubated a range of organizations that enrich and strengthen our community. Starting in 1998, we provided office space, funding, and introductions for the early founders of City First Bank. On other occasions, we shared our services with RAG, with VPP, with Act for Alexandria, with Generation Hope, with Diverse City Fund, and most recently, the Children's Opportunity Alliance in Montgomery County. These ventures speak to the catalytic nature of community foundations and our obligation to respond to pressing needs and to build the future. And while the needs of our region have evolved over time, the Community Foundation has been there when this community needed it most. We served as a community quarterback, a role we proudly embody, responded, responding to the crisis of the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon, to the financial crisis, both in 2008 and in 2011, and to the most recent COVID-19 pandemic. I want to give a shout out to Dan Mayers, our longest serving board member and the former chair of the Survivors Fund. Dan is in the audience with us tonight. In the late 90s, we enhanced our local presence by launching affiliates, now known as local offices in Montgomery County and in Prince George's County. This helped expand our local expertise and grant making initiatives like Sharing Montgomery, which is still one of the longest community, continuously running programs at our foundation. This year, we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Prince George's County Community Foundation becoming part of our Community Foundation family. Our legacy, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Our legacy in the county includes several community benefit agreements with Jack Kent Cook, with MGM, and the Waltons family, all beginning under the Wayne Curry administration. And in addition to running local and regional grant making programs in Northern Virginia and working closely with our local government partners there, we're also proud to partner with our peer community foundations in Northern Virginia. So, if our first 50 years are prologue to the future, then it means we're in for an interesting ride. <laughs> one that is full of possibility and progress, but one that will certainly bring, up, bring forth crises known and unknown, particularly as we evolve our democracy and our economy, and particularly as we pursue DC statehood and the challenges to home rule, and as we solve, cure, and resolve the structural legacies that led to the inequality, the inequity, and every gap our sector seeks to close. So does all of this sound ambitious? It does. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but when I was a kid growing up in Southern Virginia, I wasn't particularly confident that we would see the first African American to be elected governor of my home state. Nor was I fully confident in 1994 that South Africa would elect Nelson Mandela and that that country would execute one of the most successful transitions of power and truth and reconciliation processes the world has ever seen. I'm not sure I fully believe that we'd see the day where Barack Obama would become the first black president of these United States. And yet, all of these evolutions to democracy, to our democracy, happened over the span of 20 years, not 50 years, a 20 year span. So to evolve our economy, the same bold approach 
to possibility is required. This place in history is where I often refer to as the in-between. It feels incremental. And sometimes we take one step forward and then we take one step backwards. But when we roll up our sleeves to do the work, we build coalitions. We listen to people. We shift hearts and mind. And we change policies so that we can scale, so that we can experience the transformative. The Community Foundation is committed to the possibilities and doing the work in between that leads to the truly transformational. And that's why I am so excited that our Board of Trustees approved a 10-year strategic plan, a 10-year strategic plan, that offers us a North Star of increasing economic mobility and closing our region's racial wealth gap. Our plan lays out the critical path to grow our foundation and to place more resources in the hands of people who need them the most. And now as we celebrate the Community Foundation's 50th anniversary, I have some exciting news to share. Over the last year, our Board of Trustees has quietly launched the leadership phase of Together We Prosper, a $50 million campaign to set us on the path to closing our region's racial wealth gap. This is a three-year campaign that's co-chaired co by trustees Karen Leader and Bill Taylor, and it will fund two critical priorities of our strategy. With your support, we will raise and deploy capital to put to powerful economic strategies to work in parts of our community experiencing the deepest disparities and historical disinvestment. We'll invest in guaranteed income pilots in children's trust accounts that will allow them to begin building wealth as early as kindergarten, and we'll support other wealth building strategies for people who need them the most. The most. Our strategy has us moving people from crisis to stability, from stability to mobility, and really ultimately having a real shot at thriving in our region. Our second priority in Dow Greater Washington will help us to serve the needs of the community, of this community today and into building for the future by building permanent funds for our foundation and for the not-for-profit sector to ensure that they are philanthropic resources for generations to come. So some say that the racial wealth gap is too big to be solved. We believe it's too urgent to be ignored. Again, if past is prologue to the future, we will achieve this goal, and we will continue to transform this democracy and our economy in all the ways that our founders and my ancestors faithfully imagined. Thank you all very much. So now I am very honored to have worked with an amazing host committee representing decades of former trustees who've served the Community Foundation and our region. And I am especially grateful for the host committee co-chairs, Chirito Cravant and Kenny Empson. Chirito served as chair of our board during Terry's tenure, and Kenny worked at the Community Foundation for 21 years and then served on the board for six years. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chirito and Kenny. I welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Tanya. Um, me and Chirito actually get to do the fun part now. Um, so uh, it's uh, just an honor to be a co-chair with Chirito. Uh, she's a superstar. It's also um, fantastic to be able to honor Terry Freeman. Uh, 15 great years working for you, Terry. You're a superstar. But I do have to thank the host committee overall. Um, the, the, the committee, like Tanya said, goes back 30 plus years of work for the Community Foundation. Um, wouldn't be here, obviously, uh, without all that work that was done. So thank you, host committee, and thank you, the current trustees as well. You've been doing some great work. And with that, I will hand it over to the great Chirito Cravant. We, mm. <laughs> we make a wonderful team, don't we? Yes. Um, I think so. Uh, good evening. 
You know, it's a special honor to be here because um, we're celebrating the best of the best, which means we're celebrating ourselves. Uh, we are the greatest community that can possibly be together tonight. So may we take a moment and before we celebrate the very, very best, we celebrate ourselves too. Um, Terry is exactly what we all wish we could have as a sister or as a real friend. Uh, from the moment I was part of the Community Foundation, I had a great pleasure. That's the beauty about being old. <laughs> because um, for, I think, about 40 years or so, I had the opportunity to meet Mrs. Graham and many, many individuals who were just extraordinary people in the community. But you know, their hearts were the Community Foundation, Vicky Sand and others. And so when the moment came, and Bill, you were ready for something else in life, when the moment came that the Community Foundation needed a new leader, it was just the perfect moment in history to have the opportunity to bring not only one of an extraordinary manager, but really the first American, African-American woman who was ready to take a very, very large and complex task. So Terry was officially selected, but officially, so well, to be part of the Community Foundation. And from day one, it was clear to all of us that she was the leader's leader. She understood what the complexity of the foundation was to bring all those families and all those individuals who needed to be sure that they were doing us something for others, which is the financial component of the foundation. And she also knew and taught us and, and guide us to understand how much the community, the children, the people in the communities needed to be sure that we never gave up on them and that we really concentrated on what really mattered. So Terry, not only is my sister and our friend, but she's also someone that, as the years have gone by, because she was with the foundation for 20 years. The 20 years she made us laugh. The 20 years she made us work really hard. And you know, when things were complicated, she always had that hope that all of us together could resolve the problem. And as history of the region became more and more complex, she always helped us figure out not to divide us, but to unify us. So she's a wonderful mom. She was a terrific, terrific friend and she's also a leader, that we should continue really, continue learning from her. So I'm going to invite Terry, but before she has the opportunity of giving us a, a few minutes, I'm also going to suggest that since I'm not very eloquent and I'm dyslexic and I couldn't read all the fancy words that they prepare for me, I would suggest that you uh, view for a minute of this wonderful, wonderful um, message um, about um, Terry. Terry Freeman is the quintessential example of the spirit of philanthropy. She is the first African-American woman uh, to have been named president and CEO, and in being the longest serving president and CEO of the Greater Washington Community Foundation. That's a, a long history of impact in the context of our 50-year history, uh, and it's worth us celebrating. When I think about the spirit of philanthropy, I think about trust, and I think about generosity, and I think those are two words that really capture who Terry Freeman is. She looks at community opportunities and resources as not just the funding, but committing to helping uh, our community in meaningful ways. Terry brought an enormous amount of energy, a, uh, an ability to articulate her thoughts and vision, and an incredible capacity to listen. Being at the helm of the Community Foundation during the 9-11 attacks nationwide, but, but especially here in the Pentagon, and leading all the crisis response that was associated with that. Our Community Foundation, especially under Terry's leadership, really developed a playbook for crisis response. 9-11 brought problems that none of us could have anticipated as board or as members of the Terry staff. Terry was working with 
uh, the community to say we've put in place the mechanism for us to work together. And we raised 25 million, but we raised 25 million in small gifts to the people who opened their hearts and checkbooks at an idea that this entity, the Community Foundation, stood ready to do its part of moving money to need. You know, it's commonplace to talk about race and racism and anti-racism. Um, but 20 years ago, that just wasn't the case. And so uh, our community foundation was pushing the envelope then. Putting race on the table was like the premier uh, conversation that was being had about race in our region. And actually, it was another example of how what happened under Terry's leadership really put us on a national stage. Terry Freeman has a heart for community. Her ethos is really around growing and strengthening and building community. I started Generation Hope because I was a teen mom. When people told me your life is over and you're not going to, to be able to go to college, you're not going to be successful. And when I walked across the graduation stage, I was really committed to making sure that other young parents could have that same success. I think about how I felt when I first sat across from her in our first meeting. She didn't have to take that meeting with me, you know, we were a fledgling organization. She said, I'm going to join your board, and uh, I was just floored. We started with 17 mothers. Today we support 142 teen moms and dads across the D.C. metro region. They're attending 20 different two and four year schools. And so to sit across from, from a black woman who holds that seat and so giving in that seat and believes in you know, the importance of supporting um, other leaders, especially leaders that look like her, I think was critical for me to see that and to experience it in such an early stage for Generation Hope. Yeah, I think wherever uh, Terry places her, her footprint, there is an imprint from growing our community foundation to you know, running and actually breathing new life into the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis uh, to the work that she's doing now at the Reginald Lewis Museum. The National Civil Rights Museum is located at the historic Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. And Terry came to the museum in 2014. She's had an important role in the museum uh, where it is today and our success today. She entered the museum field having never worked in this field before, but with a whole lot of awareness and knowledge of the issues that we create um, and, and the things that we can address as critical community institutions. I think that there is so much that she has done and accomplished um, that we want to continue to uh, emulate and replicate and build on. Congratulations, Terry. This honor is well deserved. Congratulations, Terry. I am so incredibly proud of you, and I can't think of anyone who is more deserving of this honor and recognition. You're one of the very, very exceptional, and I know great things are going to happen now that you're back. Good luck. Thank you, Terry Freeman, and congratulations on being our Spirit of Philanthropy Award recipient for 2023. And I want to congratulate you on receiving this Community Foundation Spirit of Philanthropy Award. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think first we'd like to give you a chance to sort of reflect on the honor or re reflect on your years of service. Um, let's start at the beginning. 1996, you were named the Community Foundation's first female CEO, its first black CEO, and eventually you became its longest serving CEO after nearly 20 years on the job. That's quite an accomplishment. Uh, absolutely. What do those distinctions mean to you? So first of all, let me just say uh, to Tonya, to the current board of trustees of the Community Foundation, Thank you for um, thinking that I was the right person to receive this award in the Community Foundation's 50th year. But I also want to say thank you to all of the staff that worked for me <laughs> when I was there. I'm sorry, but thank you anyway. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> for, for all of the many uh, board members, I saw a lot of board members come through the Community Foundation. Thank you all um, for your partnership. Um, this was hard work, but it was good work. And I see that the good work is continuing. Now, with regard to the question that you asked, you know, 
I was saying to Chirito, it never really occurred to me that I was a first. And in fact, um, at the Lewis Museum this March, we just had an event called Ladies First to acknowledge the first uh, African-American women in the state of Maryland. And I never considered myself being a first, so it wasn't something that I thought about. But I will say that the work could be challenging sometimes, um, especially as an African-American woman. Um, I, was, I was blessed to be able to have Kenny Empson work with me for as long as he did. Um, he was a great partner. Um, to be able to work with individual donors and talk with financial advisors and what have you. But I think um, what I really was so pleased about bringing to the Community Foundation was community. Mm -hmm. And it was so important to put community at the center of the work. So it was, it was a great ride. And Chirito, it was 18 years, not quite 20. <laughs> All right. Um, talk about the span of things that happened during your tenure. What are some of your most significant and your most challenging moments that you remember? So, Sean, I should have written this down because I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> and um, 18 years was, was a long time. I remember... <clears throat> For when I first um, got to the Community Foundation, <laughs> we were located in Georgetown in a little brownstone on, was it on M Street? Was it? I, I can't remember. Anyway, it, it was n not Wisconsin. It was not the most suitable or, uh, space for the Community Foundation. And certainly running up and down stairs in Kenny's office was basically in a broom closet. Um, and... It was a nice broom closet. Um, but we had, you know, it was like um, learning what the Community Foundation was doing at that time and making the decision at one point that we needed to stop. Mm -hmm. We needed to stop doing everything that we were doing, take a pause, evaluate, and figure out where we could do the most good. So we changed our um, emphasis at, at, at that particular time, and that was in the late 90s. <clears throat> There were uh, individual funds like the Bridge Builders Fund, which focused on uh, building bridges between the straight and uh, gay communities and having those two communities literally fund the fund for themselves. That was <clears throat> a first. We had a fund that focused on uh, new citizens coming into uh, the, this region that we received money from the Soros Foundation to, to seed that, and that became a significant um, a part of the Community Foundation's work, working with um, immigrants to the region because this was a large gateway for new citizens. And I remember us having a conference <clears throat> for day laborers, and it was interpreted, but it was interpreted for the English speakers, not for the Spanish speakers. So we had it, it was in Spanish and the, um, interpreted in English. Of course, um, you know, I can go on and on with so many, you know, there was the Neighbors in Need Fund, which uh, came up when in 2000, gosh, which financial crisis was this? 2008, I guess it was. Um, and I remember having a conversation with one of our nonprofit partners, and she said to me, Terry, um, we're having a, um, a, a turkey drive in a couple of weeks, because it was right around uh, the, uh, the holiday. She said, but I don't have any turkeys. And I thought, okay, so we have to do something. So we came up with the Neighbors in Need Fund, and the challenge that I gave to the staff was none of this three months long um, uh, proposal process. These folks need the money now. We have to figure out a way to give them the money now. And we did. Um, and so that was, that was something that was really also very, very uh, meaningful. But of course, the most major was the Survivors Fund. Um, you know, everybody remembers where they were on 9-11 when that occurred. Um, 
By the way, I was sideswiped by a, an ambulance coming up 16th Street, trying to get home that day. Ambulance didn't even know they had hit my car. Um, but the next day, coming into work, I was thinking, what, what does this all mean? And I was on the telephone with Don Graham and Julie Rogers from the Meyer Foundation. And we decided that the Community Foundation was the place for us to establish a fund that would support even though New York had talked to us about you know, doing something in partnership, we knew that there was something that was gonna be needed specifically for this region. So we decided to set up the fund. The uh, Washington Post made the decision that they would announce the fund. In the, so 9-11 was on a Tuesday. That weekend, they would announce the fund. And on Monday, we had just bins of contributions. We thought we would raise five to seven million dollars and the Fannie Mae Foundation called and said we're giving five million dollars. So we knew right then um, and those contributions came in in five million dollar increments but we also received a letter from two young children mm -hmm. who had saved up their allowance and I don't know the exact amount but it was something like a dollar thirty-five cents that they had contributed um, and it was just so, you know, everybody was dealing with this crisis, but we were working through this crisis. And um, I have to say, that fund would not have been the success that it was had it not been for the leadership of Dan Mayers and for the hard work of Kathy Welpley and Terry Lavoie, who worked very hard on this fund and the partnership that we have with the Northern Virginia Family Services. So um, it was truly, it was a labor of love. Um, it was a labor of love and all of that, I think, laid some groundwork for the work that Tonya is doing now. I she, she was a little humble about that, but, but I'm just gonna go back. That was two economic recessions, multiple government shutdowns, the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, and you did it with grace. Uh, during your tenure, the Community Foundation hosted a groundbreaking multi-year conversation series called Putting Race on the Table. It forced people to re-examine the way they think about racism, racial identity, and how it affects our society. Um, this was also years before Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, and when more and more people started talking about race and its importance. Where did the idea from that original conversation come from? What did creating that kind of space for reflection and dialogue mean to you and our community? Well, um, it actually, and I know she's not here uh, this evening, but it actually uh, was a conversation started by Lee Christian Parker, who worked at the Community Foundation. And Lee was working on education issues. And at the time, the, the big talk was around this, the gap mm -hmm. between, um, the education gap between um, African-American children and white children. And we made the decision that we needed to better understand what the issues were. We needed to kind of go deeper into the context of the issue, and we needed to talk to people who were doing things about the issue that were, be, that were successful. And I don't know, I came up with the title, Putting Race on the Table, and I, because I wanted it to be provocative. I wanted people to stop and be a little concerned about the topic um, and be a little uncomfortable, frankly, and understand this was, in the early 2000s that we're talking about. Um, and, and so what we did was we brought in speakers from around the country to talk to our community, nonprofits, other foundations, uh, about what was going on in education, what the issues really were in education, and who was doing really good work. Um, and one of the people that we brought in, I remember, um, because he's just a fantastic person, is Jeffrey Canada uh, from New York. And he talked about his schools that he had um, pulled together. And then at one point, we um, actually had a donor annual meeting at the museum, it was a Smithsonian, the American history, come on, Kenny, help me. And they, 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 the exhibit that they had was race, 
Are We That Different? And we had a panel of, um, of individuals. Uh, Michelle Norris was the commentator. And John Powell was one of the speakers to talk about these issues of race that at that time, as you said, were not being talked about. And I will actually also say that back then, I, I, I kind of coined for the Community Foundation the idea of focusing on equity, access, and opportunity. And at that time, people were asking me, what equity? You talking about equity in our homes? And I was like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So, but now people get it. So, uh, but that was, the, that was how it got started. Um, just to keep us on track, um, you, during your tenure, you encouraged donors to have a more holistic, forward-looking approach to philanthropy, multi-year grants, uh, general operating support, as well as building an endowment for the future. We've got a great audience here tonight. Why are these things so important to nonprofits, and how do they support more strategic philanthropy? Well, I, I realize that um, funding to keep the lights on in organizations is not very sexy, but it is really critical because they can have a ton of incredible programs. And yes, it's nice to take care of the babies and the children and be able to buy books and make sure the band has uniforms, but none of that happens if you don't have a place for your organization, if you don't have good leadership, if the leadership doesn't have a pension or a retirement package. General operating support is the lifeblood for nonprofit organizations. And I, you know, multi-year allows nonprofits to then plan, right? If you are constantly going from year to year to year, trying to raise whatever the budget is, you don't really have an opportunity to plan. Multi-year grants allow that. Then there's endowment, and that's like the holy grail, right? Because endowment allows nonprofit organizations to say there will be a future, right? And so as the Community Foundation is raising money for its endowment, I encourage all of you this evening to consider making a contribution because that is going to ensure that there's a Community Foundation 50 years from now. Absolutely. Terry, thank you so much. Thank you for thank you. Um, your insight and for just inspiring uh, conversation today and inspiring all of us here tonight. You certainly embody the spirit of philanthropy and the theme for the evening. And as someone who's led this groundbreaking work to help us confront our history while also inspiring hope and healing for our community, we thank you. We appreciate you. We truly appreciate your service to the greater Washington region and for dedicating your life's work to social justice, civil, and human rights. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, please give Terry a big round of applause. Thank you. Again, a huge thank you to all of you for spending the time. Thank you for all the performances. Thank you, Sean and Terry. Thank you, Chirito and Kenny and all of the honorary uh, host committee members, to our co-chairs for the fundraising campaign, Karen and Bill. Thank you so much. We have an amazing, I think we have about two hours or an hour and a half left to spend time together socializing, eating and drinking, and doing a little dancing. And so we're gonna wrap up this program now and very orderly move back to the second floor uh, for the rest of our reception. Again, thank you all, every, thanks everyone for being with us for our 50th anniversary. Let's continue to celebrate.